-hmm. So it's unstable to have a mass point where you know you're tying with someone. If you increase your bid by epsilon, then you outbid them. episode of the Mixtape Podcast, I had the distinct pleasure of speaking with Susan Athey, a profoundly distinguished economist within the American Economics Association. They used to say that the John Bates Clark Award given to an economist under 40 who made a substantial contribution to economic science was a leading indicator of winning the Nobel Prize in economics one day. But even if Dr. Susan Athey had not won the John Bates Clark Award, which she had won, has one. Uh, you would only need to see her amazing career uh, to realize that she is a likely candidate herself one way, one day to win the Nobel Prize. Major discoveries to auction theory, major discoveries in micro theory, but also in commerce. First chief economist at Microsoft, uh, sits on the board of like a half dozen firms, tenured at MIT, Harvard, now a professor in Stanford and continues to make major contributions to an entirely different area of causal inference, experimentation, and machine learning. Every time we talk, I just enjoy also uh, witnessing her passion and her excitement for life and her uh, own views about, uh, about living a good life as an economist. I consider it a great thing that she is currently the president of the American Economics Association. And it is my, it pleasure, is my to pleasure to get to you to her in this podcast, uh, Dr. Susan A. Uh, my name uh, is Professor Scott Cunningham, and this is Stanford Mixed Tape University. Uh, Susan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's great to talk to you today. Okay. Well, so before we get started, kind of talking about, well, I kind of wanted to talk about your whole life. So um, I wanted to hear, uh, you know, you're you're one of the, if I, am I correct that you went to college when you were 16 years old? Is that right? That's, that is right. That's, you're the first person. I haven't known anybody like that. So I, I wanted to ask a little bit, what was it like? Um, what were you like as a, as a kid? And what was it like going to college at such a young age? Yeah, well, I think actually today, so many things would be different. So that really got, it was precipitated by the fact that I was accelerated in math, um, which is of course a much more common thing now. Um, so I was going to run out of math in my high school and, and need to go to community college um, so or some other thing. So already life was going to be complex. But actually, a lot of the reason that I went to college was that I was kind of a goof off in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I, <laughs> I went through a bit of a rebellious phase and I was skipping school, skipping class, you know, running off campus um, and you know, getting and not being very serious about my academics. And, but I had enough self-awareness to think that if I kind of changed my environment, I probably would get more serious. I had been serious before I could be serious again. I just kind of turned high school into a little bit of a game. So I, I actually just wanted to get out because I, I wanted to change my environment. And, and I think I was, I was exactly right. It was a great, it was exactly what I needed to get to much harder work where I really needed to get serious and um, also be around other people who were, you know, very smart, but also had a variety of interests. Um, so I didn't really have to choose, you know, being like one type of person or another type of person. Like I, I, I did, you know, college has a much bigger pool of people to, right. to, to hang out with. Yeah, right, 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 right. So you were you were sort of a, one of these super super smart students that that was kind of bored by your high school environment. Was that is that accurate? I went to a great high school. I mean, it was a great public school, and you know, people at the top of my class went to top colleges. Um, but it, it was still, yeah, I just sort of got into treating it as a little bit of a game, and and it was hard to kind of get find find my way back. Yeah. So you majored in you went to Duke, age sixteen. You triple majored computer science, econ, and math. How, how quickly did that happen? Yeah, I I had in order to help support myself in college, I had gotten a summer job for I, I lived in the D.C. area, and um, the there was a 
kid in my high school whose siblings had started a startup that sold computers to the government. Wow. So I was helping write bid proposals um, for procurement auctions for computers. And so that was, you know, <laughs> I had actually been interested in programming. I was programming in basic when I was in elementary school. You know, I knew about computer science, but it wasn't really a passion of mine. But then when I got interested in computers again for this summer job, and actually I got the job as a receptionist, um, but, but I very quickly started doing all sorts of other stuff too, because it was like a 30 person company. Wow. So, so that got me interested. Actually, that job got me interested in a couple of things. It got me interested in computers and computer science. Um, and it also got me interested in procurement auctions. Mm -hmm. So I, I took computer science classes to start with. Um, but I also took some econ partly because I thought, you know, maybe I might go to business school or, um, you know, I wasn't really sure, but the econ was, was sort of just a, you know, a little bit of a lark. Um, and it was only later that I, I figured out how to pull it all together. And that story was actually kind of a, another serendipity. So I had, uh, I joined a sorority and um, the vice president of my sorority is, was a woman, Leslie McFarland, now Leslie McFarland Marks, who's an economist um, at Duke, at Fuqua. And uh, she was a research assistant for uh, Professor Bob Marshall, who was working on auctions. And so she wanted someone, she was looking for someone to be a research assistant and I was a computer science major. So she got me a job to administer his workstation as a computer science major. And then when he found out that I had been bidding in procurement auctions, mm. he, he got me involved as a research assistant. And that's really what showed me what was, um, how I could take all these interests I had and turn them into policy. So mm. he wrote some papers that were inspired by problems in the procurement system that I that I identified for him. Wow. And then he he showed me how to write, you know, wh what it meant to write a model and he testified in front of Congress. So wow. it was it was super exciting like as a, you know, as a kid I had this summer job, started as a receptionist. You know, it's like, this is so crazy. They have these things, these protests and there's this hold up thing that happens and suddenly, you know, 2 years later you know, he's my advisor sitting in front of Congress testifying they need to reform the, re the regulation and, ch and yeah. fix this problem. So yeah. I was like, wow, this is so cool. Wow. So then so then Bob told me that I needed if I want to go to grad school, I needed math. Sure. Um, and so the math major came sort of at the end when I loaded up on math classes to get ready for grad school. I bet that was quite, you know, I was talking to, I interviewed uh, Gary King last week and um, he, he was talking about how important it is for high school students to not necessarily participate in research, but to be at that level where they can understand the discoveries as it's happening. I bet that was quite an experience for you to, to see your what you had noticed going on uh, all of a sudden moving into the area of policymaking. I, I can only imagine how cool that must have been. It was super, it was really thrilling. And at that time, it's funny because, you know, now computer science is so practical. Right. But at the time, computer science was more theoretical. So, you know, for my, my computer science work, I would be, you know, just locked in the lab. We would pull all-nighters because you had to work at the terminals, you know, so... It would be, you know, me and a bunch of very unkempt other humans, mostly right. guys, you know, there at four in the morning, you know, trying to debug our C code or whatever. Right. And it was interesting, but I was, it wasn't motivating right. um, in the same way. Like it was intellectually interesting, but it wasn't like inspiring. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the econ was you know it was inspiring and interesting uh, so can you tell me what the, what the, what it is what is it about you that you think econ makes is inspiring that like to the next person or what was it about econ that was so inspiring well you could make the world better uh -huh. <laughs> you could you could solve a real problem and of course you can do that in computer science too and and now modern computer science has a lot of overlap with with economics actually right. but at the time the econ economics seemed like it was it was it wasn't and it wasn't just building something but it was really changing a system like i i liked the idea of changing laws um and i also learned 
both in undergrad and especially in grad school, um, that what I, one thing I have a knack for is like finding a good abstraction for a complicated problem. Mm. And it's just like, it sings, you know, it's like a chord or harmony or something, you know, when the, the way it makes my brain feel, if you take, if you're like, I don't understand this, what's going on? Why does the world work this way? You know, it's, it all feels like a morass of, you know, am I, and then you're like, ah, you know, I can't, I can't understand. And then when you find a clear framework where it all makes sense, then it's just, ah, now I, you know, great. Now I can, I can, you know, when you understand it, you can write it down in math, you can communicate it, you can break it down. Wow. And, and then you, and once you've broken it down in a clear abstract way, you can, you also, it's much more easy to figure out how to do something about it, how to change something. So are you describing something that happens independent of the actual modeling? of some phenomenon, this is something that, or it's something in that whole part of the process of modeling? It's in the process, I think. It's it's the iterative process. And I and I actually have found that to be common across, um, you know, applied economic theory, but also mm. empirical work. Like, yeah. you know, you can see, you can see a set of puzzling facts in the data and you're like, well, how is this? How can this go, you know, how is this coefficient this way? And how is this set of descriptive statistics that way? And, you yeah. know, I don't, I, this looks like a mess. Is there a mistake? Is there a problem in the data? And then when you understand the data generating process and you say, aha, like, you know, if the world works this way, right. you know, all of these numbers make sense. Mm. And then you're like, aha, you yeah. know, that, that's great. Right, 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 right. Or, or, or even like, you know, for econometrics, like you can, you can be struggling with like, well, I don't know, you know, here's this formula, like, where does it come from? What does it mean? Mm -hmm. You know, you're just applying it. And then somehow you get the insight of, oh, okay, you know, this is, this is why things are this way. And then once you understand, you remember it, you can, again, you can explain it, you can teach it. Uh -huh. um, and I love that part. I love the teaching part too. Um, I feel like teaching something over and over again, um, you refine and refine and refine again. So you really get to the essence of, you know, why something works. It's only when you can really explain it to someone else that you're sure that you understand it. Yeah. 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 What was the most memorable discovery of your, uh, of, bef of your like leading up to the John Bates Clark award? What, what's, you know, kind of like the thing you look back on as, as, just this really, really important intellectual experience that you had that, you know, people probably don't know <laughs> of that, of that body of work. You know, when I'm ever, when I'm helping my, my kids do application essays, um, they, they're, there are always these questions like, what's the most important, this the most important that, and my kids say, I can't answer that. And uh, I yeah. say, and I say, don't answer that question. <laughs> Just answer a question. Yeah, okay. So I don't, I think it's really hard to, to do superlatives like that. Um, I, I can, I say that, um, you know, I, I wrote this paper on existence of equilibria and um, that was really cool because there was just sort of a one aha moment when I, I Bob Marshall had actually talked to me about asymmetric first price auctions. And when I was an undergrad as a computer science major, one of the projects I worked on was trying to compute equilibria to asymmetric first price auctions. And they're, they're pathologically unstable. And in fact, that problem wasn't really satisfactorily solved until much later. Mm -hmm. um, I never solved it as an undergrad for sure. I just showed that it was hard <laughs> and, not, and that nothing worked. Um, <laughs> so I had thought about it for a long time. By the time, you know, it had been almost 10 years, I'd been exposed to that problem when I started wow. working on it again. And the differential equations were really badly behaved. But there was this moment where I realized that if you sort of turn the problem on its side and you approximated um, these these nonlinear functions as step functions, but then instead of working in the function space, so looking for equilibria in bids, mm. instead you could, where there were lots of discontinuities. So in a first price auction, if two bids are tied, mm. then one person wants to, increase their bid a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's unstable 
to have a mass point where you know you're tying with someone if you increase your bid by epsilon then you outbid them yeah. so that that's the that's a source of discontinuities basically yeah. so um i figured out that if you turned the problem on its side and instead studied equilibria in the the points at which your function stepped up uh -huh. then you had continuity in that uh -huh. dimension uh -huh. and i and i proved a fixed point theorem there and then and then took that to the limit and and the moment when i figured out that this like problem that I it was it wasn't just like somebody hadn't tried like right. a lot of people had tried for a very long time to solve this problem and that there was this super simple solution yeah I was just like this can't be right and I went around and knocked on all my colleagues doors and I said you know I found this thing this is this 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 can't be right if this was right somebody would have figured it out already yeah. but, it, but it was right yeah. Um, th there was still actually, so taking that to the final proof, actually at some point I had like a 60 page proof with like 15 or 20 different cases. And I had to stay up. I, I spent one time, I spent like three weeks. Basically I didn't, I only went home like every three days to take a shower oh and I like gosh. lived in my office. And at that point, like I already had a 60 page proof, Yeah. but I, you know, I, I wasn't sure it was right uh -huh. and nobody else could possibly check it. Right. Um, and so I needed to just obsess on it and obsess on it to figure out how to reduce like all of that complexity into wow. actually, you know, five cases or 10 cases <laughs> at least. Um, so that was pretty, it was pretty amazing. And I think after that, I never really thought of myself as the kind of person who would or could do something like that. Yeah. Um, and it just showed me a couple of things. One is like, I, it showed me that I could do a marathon. Right. Um, I just had to be really motivated mm. and it and it made me realize that a lot of people it's not like I, I don't think there's like this type of typecast that you're the type of person that locks themselves away it's more just like if you think that it's really important and you're really excited then you know you find that you can do that even if you never thought you could or you mm. never thought you would want to so so that experience is teaching you things about yourself but it's not teaching you that you're smart it's teaching you, you have the ability, you have fortitude or something like that. Is that what you're saying that you learned from that experience besides yeah. The content? Yeah, I have to say, I mean, my whole career and it's, I honestly, it's, it's sad, but it's still, uh, still impacts me today. It can be very, um, I don't quite fit the stereotype of someone who's super smart mathematically. Mm. Um, I never did. Um, and even, you know, I wasn't the fastest person. I wasn't, I never, I didn't really try math competitions, but that probably has something to do with the fact that I probably would have done well, but not super well. Yeah. If you, if you like, I was never the flashiest person. Mm. Um, and my personality doesn't seem to match. And so it can really bother people. It really, really bothers people <laughs> that I'm really good at this stuff. Everybody <laughs> wants to think it's not true um, <laughs> because it doesn't fit, especially um, if people who make it into a competition and um, I'm not that interested in competing, but it's for some people, it really bothers them to that I might figure something out that they couldn't um, because I'm not the kind of person who should be able to do that. So, but that this whole um, thing about, you know, what, like being smart, like, am I smart enough? Right. That, that, oh, I, I always doubted that because I didn't seem to be checking the boxes of the smart people. And it's taken me a long, it's really the only way that I came to have confidence in it is just like over and over and over again, I figured stuff out mm. that other people hadn't. And so wow. it just made me realize, yes, I am lucky. Like my brain makes connections that, uh, that I, the way that my brain works is, is really good at certain things. Yeah. Um, and that's been repeated, but, um, there was still a question in my mind always of, well, I'm not really a technical person. Right. I, I, I do technical stuff in pursuit of a goal, but I'm not, uh, I'm not as a person, I'm not a technical person. I'm just a person that uses that, that call can call on her technical skills when but it's effortful for me, yeah. but, but, but when motivated and, but the real strength is like figuring out what to get motivated on. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, so did you at some point, you know, kind of have 
this one of these moments where you were like, these are my goals, my goal, you know, and it moved beyond just writing papers because, you know, your your career has spanned uh, so much achievement in academia, but then, it, you know, also moving into industry. Was, was there this point where you started to have kind of these unique kind of goal setting as, a, as an economist? Sort of, I mean, I think that I'm, I'm always intentional. Like I'm not, um, you know, I'm not just kind of bouncing around, uh, but I don't think that I had an overarching goal. Like I need to be X, I need to be Y. One thing is that I never, I never really thought of myself as someone who would do X or could do X. Like I, I was, I was like, couldn't believe I got into Stanford and I really couldn't believe I got a job at MIT. Mm. And I really didn't believe I was going to get tenure, <laughs> you know? So everything that it's happened is sort of been like, wow, you know, I may, I, am I the kind of person who can do that? Or is that really going to work out for me? So um, I haven't set these really lofty aspirations, partly because I often didn't necessarily think they were even attainable. Right. So I'm, I'm much more about like, I need, I, I need something that gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Like I, I can work, I work, it's kind of weird because I don't want to um, make other people feel like they could or should have to work all the time. I were, I do work harder than pretty much anybody I know. Um, but I can't make myself work on anything. Right. I'm, I'm terrible in making myself work. I totally I'm terrible. That. I procrastinate. Like if there's something I don't want to do, like I'm, you know, if I have to give a talk tomorrow and I want to prepare it, I like start preparing it at one in the morning because I can't make myself do it beforehand. So I'm terrible at making myself work. And so yeah. What I figured out for me is the whole secret to success is just, I get to find something I'm excited about. And if I'm excited about, then I do it. And if I'm not excited, I do terrible at it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so I think, you know, but, but I get very excited about doing something I don't know how to do. Yeah. So, so I think like, okay, I, I was a theorist and then I, but I was really interested in doing something that would change the world in some way. I wanted it to have impact. And so I got more interested in applied work but I didn't know how to do it. You know, I didn't know, I didn't, hadn't even taken econometrics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't, I didn't take econometrics classes in grad school. Like I took two quarters of, econ mm -hmm. or of econometrics in grad school, the, yeah. just the first year, nothing more. So yes. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't take empirical courses in grad school. I, I did empirical work as an undergrad, but not in grad school. Right. So I was like, okay, I got to learn to be an empiricist. I got to read, I've got to go to seminars, I've got to advise, I've got to teach, you know? So that was really exciting yeah. to learn. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think, and I think the industry stuff pulled me in uh, because, again, it was impactful. Mm. Um, I was interested, you know, when so Microsoft invited me to be chief economist. Like it was completely random. I had no background at all, and I had no aspiration. It, they they called me, um, and I Is that a would, category if, at the time chief it, economist. So, like so Hal Varian was chief economist right. of Google, Google. Yeah. and Preston McAfee had been like two to three years at Yahoo right. leading a research group, yeah. but it, it wasn't really a thing. So, so Steve Ballmer had, had knew that Google and Yahoo had them and he knew that he needed advice. Um, actually, they didn't initially invite me to be chief economist. They just invited me to do some consulting, but the questions were really interesting. One place where I was prescient was that I, I had been thinking about internet search and I thought that search was important. And I thought that it was going to grow and become a more important part of how we got information and news and elections. And I was worried about all of that in 2007, when I think a lot of people still thought it was niche. I think it was my computer science background and kind of some of my entrepreneurial background that I was always intrigued by the tech sector. So, yeah. so I was very interested in that. So the, the chance to work for Microsoft in particular was really appealing because they had money, so they weren't going to have to exit. Right. Um, and they were the second place firm, so they were going to compete with, with Google. Yeah. But then the thing that made me stay was, well, many things made me stay, but one of them was that I got just completely mesmerized by the search engine as a thing. And so there were no economists there. So, you know, I was trying to work with data with everybody that I could work with were machine learner people or engineers who were supporting machine learning people. Yes. So it was a different language, a different perspective, no causal inference, no standard errors, you know, just prediction, 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 mm. um, you know, using black box algorithms. 
So I, so I, I had to learn to operate in that environment. I didn't understand it. Right. I didn't understand why they were doing what they were doing. Yeah. And there was this huge, important problem. Yeah. And somehow they gave me a lot of latitude and a lot of, it was kind of a little bit random why I got so much power. One of the things was that they kept turning over their senior management of the ad platform at the time. So there, I had more longevity than anybody else there mm-hmm. um, by, by a couple of years in. So, you know, it was this, but it was this great opportunity and there were so many things I was learning and so many things I didn't understand. And it was clear that there were so many different societal problems, whether it's like fairness or content moderation or, you know, impact on downstream industries like news or other vertical industries. There was like the auction issues. There was like how you combine machine learning and structural modeling. There was this A-B testing platform. Like nobody knew what an A-B testing platform was. I went around all the economists in 2017. Like, do you guys know they're running thousands of experiments a year? They're like, really? Like, yes, really. But I'm like, wait, you know, how do we, how do you, what do you do when you have a thousand experiments? How do you look at standard errors? Um, How big should the control group be? You know, what if there's interference? What if you're, what if you're experimenting on a market? You know, what, there were so many questions. I still haven't answered all the questions that I encountered in 2008. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and, and some of them were really interesting statistically, and some of them were really interesting societally, and some of them brought both of those things together. So at that point, it was like, how could I not be here? And then when I went, when I went back to economists, I gave this whole series, I went around a circuit and I tried to tell people how exciting it was and how interesting it was, what all the problems were. And I got some interest. People were very polite, but in the early days, you know, I didn't recruit anybody or hardly anybody to work on these problems. And so, and plus you couldn't even work on them from the outside because you couldn't even know what was going on. So this was really like, why did I stay and do this? It was like, because like, you know, every day when I got out of bed in the morning, you know, there were 15 problems that I didn't know the answer to that were intellectually interesting and important and scientifically exciting and practically exciting. So like, how could you not get out of bed and do it? Right. What was the deal? Why, why, what was the opposition uh, that you were, if you had to kind of, now that you've seen how much it's changed in, you know, 15 years, what exactly was not doing it for people in economics? Why'd they not get interested in this? Well, I think from the substantive side, you know, there had been a lot of turnover and change in tech. So when I tried to explain why I thought that Google had a durable market power, for example, Mm -hmm. but oh, well, you know, there's been so many different search engines and I like Google and it's free and it works really well. How they said they didn't want to be evil. So what's (laughs) the problem, you know? And I, and I, people didn't understand the economics and the business model behind the scenes that having that ad platform that they had was a huge barrier to entry and it would make it basically possible for them to buy or scoop up any way that anybody could compete with them. Uh, so it was so there were big economies of scale and algorithmic search, but even though economists are supposed to understand economics, yeah. they thought about the consumer product, the right. consumer side of things, not the business side of things. And they didn't understand what was happening in the background and why Google was in a position to monopolize and continue to monopolize. So I think, and they also were just like, oh, I can get my news any old way. You know, when I want to find something, I can find it. You know, I'm not, I'm not manipulated. Um, so they didn't believe that, you know, if you re-rank results, it would make a really huge difference or that Google would re-rank results. So all of these things that are now kind of obvious in everybody's concerned about the power, what, what the problems are of having one or two gatekeepers to information, um, that those problems, um, people just somehow minimize them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I knew they were small at the time, but they were coming, um, that they would be, they were coming. And then on the technical side, I, I just think, you know, there's a few things. One is, you know, people thought, econometricians, I think, thought that experiments were boring. Right. Right. Like, what do economists do? We think about estimating parameters from observational data yeah. in some way or another. Right. That's what we do. Yeah. And, and, you know, RCTs is like, there's no problem. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so, the, but in the end, that was so wrong. 
mm-hmm. because I, you know, I have many papers and there's many more papers to be written on, I would call it like advanced experimental design. Mm. So it's, you know, what do you do when you're doing thousands of experiments? It's, um, you know, how do you, in, and how do you use the data most effectively? Um, what do you, how do you do adaptive experiments, um, contextual bandits, um, and, and how do you test hypotheses afterwards? How do you learn to reuse the data? How do you map short-term outcomes to long-term outcomes? Um, again, experimentation on markets. So if you're doing an experiment that affects advertisers, advertisers compete with each other. Mm. So th- that's a very much of an unsolved problem. Um, you know, I, I designed uh, staggered rollout experiments. Mm. So um, suppose you're, if you are experimenting on markets, then you don't have a lot of markets. Right. So you, one way to do it is to design your data so that you will have essentially a setup to do diffs and diffs analysis afterwards. Um, and, and so I, you know, Microsoft, I, I designed these kinds of experiments using simulations and now I've got a paper, you know, doing it theoretically. Yeah. I started working on the paper 10 years later. (laughs) Um, you know, I, but all, I did all these things heuristically. So there were, I think people just didn't understand that, that AB testing was going to be a massive scientific area area for econometricians. And right. instead of just like something where the econometricians weren't going to be involved at all. Right. And, and then I think the other thing is like data mining and prediction were, those were pejorative terms. Right. Um, you know, prediction right. wasn't interesting to, especially to cross-sectional econometricians. That's, that's what other people do. We're smarter than the other people. Mm. Um, and so, but of course we, you know, Myself and Viktor Chernozikov and others have all shown that, in fact, you know, we can use we can use what we know from semi-parametric econometric theory, um, and there's nuisance parameters in theirs. And wherever we were using kernels before that weren't actually performing in practice, we can plug in, you know, prediction models. Yeah. Um, and that also then these algorithmic prediction methods could be adapted um, to solve different problems that the yeah. innovations were the algorithms and those algorithms could be applied to both you know structural models to causal inference and so on so I think people but people just didn't see they just tuned out when you said predictions right and then and then the applied researchers lectured me and they were like you're supposed to start with a question you're not supposed to start with the data right you know like like you know the God of economics is supposed to tell you what your question is. And, you know, you, you don't use the data to tell you what your question is. Mm, mm. Um, and, and that there was sort of almost like a moral superiority of, you know, hypothesis driven empirical work, mm. which I'm, I'm not saying that I hypo- that is wrong. It's just that yeah. also you can learn from your data. Right, right, right. Huh. That's fascinating. Yeah, no, I mean, that all resonates deeply with me. So it, it's it's definitely not like that as much now, it seems like. It seems like tech is now just uh, a massive labor market. I don't know how big it is, I wonder, but it seems like it's a really big labor market for PhD econ now. When did, when did What do you think is, is driving that change? Is that demand driven? That's firms have have changed or they recognize what economists offer or, or what what's yeah happening? well so when I was first at Microsoft like they said oh well you know why don't we make you chief economist and why don't you hire a team and at the time I realized it was I tried a few and it was really difficult and actually people some PhD economists were hired by people other than me and actually a lot a bunch of those didn't work out and so early on for there were very few there wasn't really a career path so the economist who would choose to go into a tech firm, there was a bit of adverse selection, if you like, because you mm-hmm. would have chosen a consulting job or a, you know a government job above the tech firm jobs. Right. And then when you're the only one, you know, there's so much to learn, and you have to be pretty sharp to be able to figure it all out. So it it was really hard for me to learn to navigate all these other disciplines and to be multilingual. Right. Um, and if you're just out of school, it's very hard to do that. You've like learned one thing and, you know, you don't even know how to talk about the thing you've learned, let alone everything else. Right. So I think that the, the, a lot of the early people kind of crashed and burned. And the the main place that it was really successful was like in Yahoo, it was more of a research group. So they were able to get 
really strong people because they were giving them academic freedom and the ability to do research. Oh. Um, so then in the early 2010s, I started working with the National Association of Business Economists, and we started doing um, meetups of economists and tech firms. And the early meetups had like 25 people, 30 people um, across all the tech firms. Yeah. And we all knew each other. And a bunch of them were ex Yahoo people. So, or, you know, it, and, and so it was a really small group. But then um, really the one, the company that, that I give most of the credit for this breaking out of this was um, Amazon, Pat Byerie. Um, and actually I had advised Amazon on hiring their chief economist. Um, and frankly, when, when they consulted me about Pat, Pat had been my colleague and I was like, Pat, well, he's amazing at certain things, but he's very structural, right. um, structural IO. And actually I already knew that a lot of what the tech firms were gonna need to do was applied causal inference, especially in this machine learning environment, you know, people just didn't have the patience and the, uh, for the structural modeling yeah. and you needed to do things at like a larger scale and so on. So I was like, he, you know, I was like, well, his training isn't exactly right for this, but he'd been a great PhD advisor. But he exceeded, I think, everybody's expectations. I mean, I'm just still, every time I think about what Pat accomplished, I might, I'm, I'm just, phew, how well, did he how do that? Describe to a non-economist, like a normal person that might be listening, what has Pat done at Amazon that you thought was just, was so unexpected? Well, he started with zero economists and now he has hundreds. Right. Um, and he made them productive. And that's a really hard thing to do because he's mostly hiring right out of grad school. And people who are coming right out of grad school they in economics don't know how to code, right. you know, they don't, they often don't have a lot of common sense, frankly, like, you know, they're, and so to make them productive in a business environment is really hard. And so what he did was he really built up a good mentoring system. Mm -hmm. So he did something that I also did, but he did it at a much higher scale. So one of the things I figured out very early was that you needed the, at the beginning, you needed really, really creative, smart people who were used to doing a lot of advising. So at Microsoft Research, we brought in senior stellar faculty, and then I would help them. They were doing research, but then I would get them to kind of plug into the business and give them some advice. And more senior people in economics are better at like mapping from a question to a lot of judgment about what, what's the best way to do it and what's the best way to get an answer fast and to trade off methods. Well, when you're young, you, you have a hammer and like, if this isn't a nail, you know, you don't know what to do or you try to keep hammering everything as if your hammer fits. And, and, and what you really need is a lot of flexibility, a lot of intellectual flexibility. Right. But what Pat did at Amazon is that he brought in these academics from the outside to help kind of consult and then he hired very junior people and he kind of put them together and gave them mentoring. And Pat was an amazing mentor. And then they grew and then he nurtured those people and then they were able to nurture the next group. So now they have kind of a whole machine where they are able to take in young people at scale and teach them and mm -hmm. make them productive. And then they were very successful. I think Amazon was a really good example to do this. It was better than I think Microsoft for this because in Amazon they're doing commerce. And so, you know, it's clear that economics is involved um, right. all the time and you're optimizing all the time. So, and they had a lot and, and it, it like the answer is different for different verticals and, you know, they had bundles and prime and, you know, exotic experiments that, but that involved markets. So I think that in the end that it made it more scalable, but, but it's just, if you had asked me, you know, in 2010, like, would there be hundreds you know, I just, wow, like that, I, I, I wouldn't have known how to do it. And, and I couldn't have done it, I don't think. And Pat did something that I think is very hard and very impressive. But then what that did in turn is as they started hiring at scale, our economics grew. And then we started having a conference. Um, and then we, then we ended up, um, uh, then we ended up, um, you know, starting a job market at, at NABE. And now hundreds and hundreds of people would go to that conference before the pandemic. Um, so NABE is a pretty big deal. I don't know if a lot of, maybe all these young, you know, these young economists know everything. I don't know anything anymore, but like, I mean, so NABE is a, is a pretty big part of the job market now. Yeah. So what we did, so National Association of Business Economists had traditionally focused on like 
chief economist who did like forecasting in time series, which is incredibly important, but they did not have any presence in tech firms and tech firms didn't want forecasting. They wanted microeconomics. Right. So, so I helped NABE at the beginning kind of craft a strategy for this new job market. And so we, we started creating this conference, which would allow young people to learn what a job in tech was all about. And so we had a lot of educational panels um, and you know academics, as, but as well as industry people giving presentations. And then that turned into a recruiting event. And so what we, of course, we all know there's problems with unraveling. So what we did there sort of contributes to unraveling, but it also stops unraveling. Yeah. So by saying in November, there's going to be a job market for non-academic jobs in tech that coordinated all of those jobs at the same place so yeah. other uh, so the the applicant didn't have to worry about exploding offers all the way through but it you let them sort you needed to basically sort uh ahead of time and saying i'm going to do a non-academic track well and so people will go to that job market and still go on the academic job market and so far it's been a for the labor it's been a seller's market like the phd person generally has a lot of opportunities so they generally have been able to negotiate that you know they would um that job offers wouldn't explode sometimes a team has just one position and then there are exploding offers and so you might have to give up the academic market but most of the time that hasn't happened but but people were already hiring in the fall on the non-academic job market. Mm. So this just kind of organized it and at least stopped the unraveling from going further. Oh. So, so we we then set up this job market at NAEP um, and at least pre-pandemic, it was getting you know hundreds of people and like 30 or so firms. And, and what I liked about that was, I think it really helped the applicant make a much more informed decision. Right. Um, they what's, could go to this it, conference and see what, see what it was all about. What's COVID done to it? Well, I mean, it went offline. And so, yeah. you know, it was, it hasn't been like this huge hundreds of persons conference, but um, it probably will, hopefully it'll be back this year. So it's um, not, it, it's not optimal even for you. So I'm just curious as a theorist, it, it, it's not optimal for there to be one conference since there's these two, like just everybody go to the ASSA. The problem, the problem about the ASSA is that there was no signaling from the part of the the PhD person. Yeah. So you like if if a tech firm posts a job on oh, JOE, right. then they're just going to get hundreds and hundreds of applicants, and the people might not even know what a tech job is. Yeah. Um, you well, Nate. you go to Nate. You, you've you've signaled preference. Yeah, you've signaled interest, and also you're going to go get educated at Nate. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I mean, you're you're going to. Be able to decide is this that's for me awesome. or not and and yeah. so it's 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 really i think it's improving the information flow right. and the uh, and enabling people and if you go and you interview for these jobs at the end of it you're going to have a pretty good idea what this is all about right so you can step out of it or you can lean into it if that's oh. what you want oh that's really ingenious i didn't know anything about that um that's great uh so so you've this is great. I, I, I have topics here to list that I wanted to keep talking about one thing, but I also wanted to, 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 to talk about other things. So one of the things I feel like uh, uh, that, that you've seen that I think even fewer economists have seen is this side of, of like the board and working with boards. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about just, you know, what, what, if, what, what is it about boards that you didn't know and now that you do know, what has that experience been like? Yeah, so I started out as advising, as an advisor for firms, and a lot of professors who are in business schools will get a chance to do that. And even econometricians, um, you know, you'll have students who go out into machine learning careers, AI careers, and end up in startups, and they may come to you and ask you to be an advisor for their firm. Mm -hmm. And so as an advisor or a board member, um, you know, you really get to see how the sausage is made. Right. Um, it's it's interesting though because a lot of times you'll get asked to be an advisor because of a very narrow expertise yeah. um and then you'll get used to, for that advice a few times but then like say once you decide like what you're doing <laughs> that expertise may not get called into play again but when you get if you're helpful to firms they might use you as a general sounding board and so it was really interesting to me to see how valuable my training as an economist was to yeah. general thinking, 
like right. strategic thinking. So being able to break down a problem into its components. Um, and if it's, you know, an AI or a machine learning firm, just being able to cut through stuff, like everybody be like, oh, I, I, you know, neural net this, you know, AI that. And you're like, well, wait, you know, <laughs> what's your problem exactly? Like if you have observational data and you're not running experiments and you're saying that your goal of your company is to make decisions, right. you've got a little bit of a problem. Right. You know, you can sort of cut through the baloney and say like, if you have observational predictive data, that's gonna be useful for X, but it's not gonna be useful for Y. You know, right. it'll be useful for prioritization, but you know, hey, how are you actually going to run experiments and learn about whether interventions actually work, whether it's prioritizing salespeople or whether it's, you know, prioritizing people for inspections or something else. Right. So, you know, these are, um, I think having these high level insights, um, you, it's surprising how even the people who are running the companies don't always have a great conceptual framework for what they're doing. Yeah. And, and so bringing a clear conceptual framework is really beneficial. Mm. Um, I also learned a ton of other stuff while being on the boards, um, you know, how financing works and what really motivates companies. Mm. And, you know, like, I think I have a much better model of why companies do what they do, yeah. having seen the decision making process. And right. I think it also helps me think about regulation and policy when you see how um, regulation you know, really affects things. And, and I, I have to say that it's made me think differently because um, even if you're a very pro-regulation person and you understand the need for regulation, when you see the, how it works in practice and that it's often co-opted to help incumbents um, keep out entrance and, and so on, um, you know, you get a little bit more skeptical about the role of government um, and, and it's made me really motivated now to think about, well, okay, how can I help? How can government regulate more effectively? Um, both in the tech space where understanding how tech works is helpful for understanding how to regulate it, yeah. um, but also just general regulation. Right, 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 right. So what, what is it, what are the characteristics that make an economist a particularly valuable member of a board? As opposed, you know, what, what are, I'm sure there's a set of skills, non-cognitive, cognitive, and experience that makes them really excel. Well, so I say there's some disadvantages because our assertive style um, can come on too strong. Yeah. So um, you, in business in general, uh, economists often need to be re-educated to behave better, and that's been a consistent message. It comes up at these NAEP conferences and everything else that economists you you need to be constructive. Mm -hmm. You need to be nice, respectful, helpful. That's, that's what makes you good in the business world. Right. Um, and so a lot of my opportunities came, like I work with people at Microsoft and then they started running Rover, this, this dog sitting, um, dog walking company. And they wanted me because I had been helpful to them. Right. Um, right. And if you're not helpful, if you're condescending or rude, yeah. then people don't want you. Right. Um, but we, we forget that the way we talk to each other is actually <laughs> pretty rude from most people's perspective, direct. Um, so, you know, but so once you get over the social norms of, of making sure that you're constructive and you're not having intelligence conversation com competitions in the boardroom, right. um, being able to break things down, I think it, this is kind of a theme in our conversation today. It's being able to take a complicated situation and break it down into its logical components. Right, right. And, and then yeah. that's really important. The other thing is just being able to ask questions. And I think one way that I've learned to both be uh, socially appropriate while being still, um, you know, not, not allowing something that doesn't make sense to get past is just to ask questions. Right. And I think we, we, we have learned to ask precise questions mm -hmm. if we do it nicely to say, well, I just didn't follow that. Or like, well, let me try to explain this back to you. If, let me see if I'm understanding this. You know, you said right. X implies Y implies Z, but I didn't quite get, you know, well, how does Y imply Z exactly? Or are there other things that could be going on? Yeah. And then, you know, and then everybody's so appreciative when, because probably if you didn't understand, other people didn't understand either, but they don't know how to even ask the question. So I think we're good at logic. And so being able to, you know, 
break things down. And it's the same thing, like you'll see a lot of observational data coming across in presentations in boardrooms yeah. and just asking like, well, well, where did that come from exactly? Like, how did you draw that conclusion? Um, well, couldn't it have been this? Like a lot of the practice we get in um, applied microeconomic seminars is, is really good if we just yeah, take the nice the, the, the nice part of that, and that it's like, the nice part yeah except yeah for, could, well uh, couldn't it have couldn't it also have been this way or like wouldn't those numbers look the same if this other thing was true yeah, you know I, that 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 story, kind of thinking the scoring of points in a seminar is probably not appreciated as much amongst in, in, no in, in, no not not scoring points um but being helpful being helpful right being curious being helpful uh yeah and right. being willing to be uh, willing to say that you don't know. Right, right, right. I would say that in the last five years, that's been one of my biggest mantras every day is I say, if I'm in a meeting and I'm not understanding, I'm going to say that as soon as possible. Right. Um, cool. Because if, if I wait until 10 minutes later and I'm not understanding, it's, it's that much harder to say that you didn't understand. Well, that's even hard for an economist. I think that economists don't like to, they don't like to, I I think a lot of people, a lot of economists don't want to look like they don't know. know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, that's the, one of the real downsides of a culture of one-upmanship is that you are afraid to say when you don't understand, but if you don't say when you don't understand, and it's the same thing like your PhD student comes in and if, in, in, you know, you're five minutes in, and if you're not following, then 25 minutes in, it's really hard to say like, I don't, I, what, what did, what did Z mean again? Right. <laughs> you know, like, well, I, wait, I forgot what your topic was. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to do that 25 minutes and it feels disrespectful. Mm. You know, it makes you feel like you've been dishonest nodding in the last 20 minutes. So there's a lot of pressure not to say it later. But one of the things I've, the, the most important confidence, self-confidence thing that I have gained recently is to really believe that if I don't understand, there's at least a 90, 95% chance to understand either. And right. when you really are confident in that, then you're not afraid to ask questions. Uh, yeah, and, right. of course. And, and then your questions, and then you also feel better when you're asking the questions because you're not nervous. Well, especially if you're not, if you're not nervous, room. you're going to ask nicer. Yeah, Sorry, right. especially in a big room, the probability that I'm the only one <clears throat> who's confused is is falling with the number with the size of n. So all the more reason to be, you know, to speak up. You know, so many things require courage. You know, to to courage within yourself to you know, not be afraid of what other people are going to think or something like that. Yeah. And of course, there's an art then because it, you might be wrong. So I try to, <clears throat> mm-hmm. I, I like, if I start, I'll say, well, if I'm the only one who's, you know, I say like, I'm not a finance person. So, you know, that, that went by kind of fast for me. If I'm the only one not understanding this, let's take this offline. Right. But I was confused about this point. Did everybody else get that? Right. Right. And then somebody else will say, yeah, I was confused too. Mm-hmm. And and then you and then you kind of know. Whereas sometimes people will say, "Well, let's take that offline," or like that's yeah, a detail. Yeah, 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 and right. then and then so you just have to leave people the opening to choose whether to answer your question or not. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's that's awesome. You know, I mean, that kind of makes it's funny. You started off kind of saying, I don't know if exactly how you said it, but you you sort of implied that you didn't feel like you were always like this issue of your intelligence, not looking like what it might, you, you know, a person might think it should look like kind of almost is given you this ability to be incredibly the right thing at the right time all over the place. You know, I mean, you sort of, uh, you saying that you maybe don't, didn't feel like you were the fastest mathematician or, you know, it's like you're here you are like saying I, it makes you OK to maybe it made you OK to, to say, I don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think if like if my self-worth isn't all tied up in like being at the top of the totem right. pole at what I'm doing, which I never felt like I was, mm. then it's easier to say, OK, I'm going to go try something else where I know I'm not going to be at the top of the totem pole. Right. Right. I would say like when I first started giving stats seminars, it was really interesting um, because I, first of all, I, you know, I mentioned I haven't been trained as an econometrician. Yeah. I, I started writing these papers, but the people in stats, like they don't know that, you know, they, right. I'm like, what do you see? Like I'm a tenure professor at Stanford 
I've published in top stats journals. Yeah. So their assumption would be like, if I'm 50 and I've been, I'm a tenured professor in Stanford writing in top machine learning or stats journals, that clearly I must've been doing that my whole career and I must know everything. Right. So then you, but these people don't know me, you know, yeah. they don't know anything about me really, except for the papers. So right. they're just making assumptions. So I show up to give a department seminar and I'm going through the day and, you know, I feel like I'm a junior faculty because I'm walking in and like, wait, I don't, you know, they're talking about stuff and I don't, I don't really know about it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if I go give a computer science talk, you know, and people just assume that I know stuff that I don't know. Right. Um, so it's scary, uh, but it's so exciting. It's exhilarating. It, it just feels like being a junior faculty all over again, except I'm tenured. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the downside is much more limited. Right. So to me, to me, like not knowing is great, but like right now I'm working on, on, on this work on contextual bandits and it's technical in a very specific way. There's a specific type of, of theorem that gets you published in like ICML or, you know, NeurIPS or, you know, KDD, these top AI conferences, there's a certain style. Um, mm. And, you know, I knew no, I knew none of it. And I actually found it very hard to read for a while. But at this point, and it's still a little scary, but, you know, I got these great students, the students would come in to me and the students thought I knew everything. And I'm like, well, guys, you know, I don't actually know everything, but I have great questions, but I actually really don't know how to answer them at all. Like, I've never written a paper like this. I don't know how to write these proofs. And they're like, well, I think I can figure it out. But I still want you to be my advisor. I'm like, sure. They're like, yeah. So I say, okay, great, let's go. I try to get them to get co-advisors. But then we've had these, I've got a couple of students where we've had these great collaborations where, you know, they really did appreciate the guidance and the fact that I kept saying, why does it work this way? Or I don't understand this intuition or, you know, this just feels like that cannot be the best thing. I know you're, I know it looks like you're hitting an efficiency bound, but something must be in a constant somewhere because, I can think of five ways this could be better. And why is that not showing up in your math? So right. even though I can, I still couldn't sit down, I mean, well, if you put a gun to my head, I could, but like if, if it would take me a long time to try to myself write the proofs for these papers that I'm working on, like I'm not fluent in it. It's like programming in another language. Like I have to yeah. think about every single step, mm -hmm. but the students are great at it. But we actually have been super productive um, together. And it's been a little hard to come to accept that, like, it, it, that that's okay. Like, am I a fraud because I'm not the one sitting down and writing the proof? Um, but now I, you know, again, it's, it's, it's about how do you value yourself? And mm -hmm. do you, do you realize, like, it, it, you know, it really is important to ask those questions Right. Um, and say, well, well, why does this work this way? Because right. from applied causal inference, I understand a lot about how to learn about causal effects from observational data. Yeah. In these contextual bounded algorithms, we're trying to design adaptive data collection methods that will collect data and to, to learn a good policy. Mm. So, and so I understand the math of where, what you're trying to optimize for. Um, and that's really helpful. And the bandit folks are, were mostly not trained in that. So right. there's a nice, a nice collaboration, a nice intersection. But yeah. again, it's, you know, going off to do something where like, I really don't know how to do it. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and try to compete at the highest levels in doing that. Um, you have to be willing to say you don't understand and to ask your students questions. Say, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I didn't read that paper. Like, I, I don't really understand how those proofs work. Can you explain right. it to me? Right. And a little bit of lecturing, like, write random variables. We need, if there's an expectation, we have to write what it's an expectation over. Right. You know? Like, we need math. We need potential outcomes. Like, we, we do, like, so I, I'm a bit of a stickler for the notation, which actually, you know, is helpful, too. Because if you don't, if you don't understand it, then you need to get it written down well. Right. To, so you can understand it. And I'm like, look, write it so that I can understand it. I'm good at math. If, right. if you know, I need the, the letters need to map unambiguously into concepts. Yeah. And, e and even though all these other papers don't, yeah. mine do. Yeah. Because because I need to understand it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Well, we only have a couple of minutes and, and, and I just could talk to you all day. It's always so much, it genuinely so much fun every time I've met you a couple of times at a conference. It's just so much fun to talk to you. Uh, I want to know about your going forward. Uh, what are you most excited about uh, uh, sort of over the, the next, you know, you know, lap of your career that you're looking forward to? Well, yeah, it, it's hard. I, I um, so on the econometric side, um, I'm really excited. I'm still excited about this advanced experimental design stuff. Um, you know, I still haven't finished all the 
I still have not solved all the problems I encountered in 2007 and 2008. Mm. And I still have lots of problems that I did heuristically just to solve a business problem that I haven't fully built a theory for. So I'm really excited about that. I've got some young collaborators that are terrific, um, like Roshan Zhang, who's at Emory. We've been working on a couple of things on experimental design, and it's a really nice area. Hito and I have been working on those things. Um, but uh, so that's one area I'm very excited about. But frankly, like my heart is always in applications. So I kind of pop up to the methods when the methods aren't there for my applications. But I feel like I'm kind of leaning more back into the application side. Now um, I have this lab at Stanford where we are partnering with social impact organizations and bringing a lot of these ideas to bear. So like I've built a recommendation system for an Indian ed tech app and then designed a, a randomized controlled trial to evaluate that and to parse out the benefits of personalization. Um, that's also an application of off policy evaluation. Um, and uh, you know, there's interesting issues in off policy evaluation for recommendation systems when you have lots and lots of treatments. Yeah. Um, I've done that for, um, for uh, a, a service that's providing agricultural advice in India to farmers, um, similar type of thing, building recommendation systems and off policy evaluation. Mm. Um, I'm running large scale experiments. Um, I built a chatbot and I'm, I'm running large scale experiments with the chatbot to around things like misinformation. Mm. Um, so I'm pretty excited about oh. applying all of this stuff. That yeah. was the whole point and applying it now in a more social impact area. Wow. Um, and then I'm also very interested in, so I've been really thinking hard about the best way to use my talents. And I think all of this econometrics and applied econometric stuff has been super exciting, but it does miss out a little bit on like the incentive side of things. Um, so I've all this time, I've also been working on regulation starting when I was at Microsoft. Um, so I'm also interested in, trying to have more efficient regulation for the digital era. Mm. Mm. Wow. And, and, and that's like, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't mention, I'm a, I was a founding associate director of Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence for the last four years. Um, I'm just stepping off of that now. And part of what that was about was about trying to set up structures, whether it's education or best practices or rules to, so that when when these AI systems and machine learning are deployed in practice, it's safe and we avoid unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And we, we have best practices for understanding, you know, feedback effects and incentives and, you know, game theoretic aspects and manipulability and, you know, all of those elements. So yeah. that's, that's basically like understanding how it works under the hood enables you to pop up a level and think about guiding it for the benefit of humanity. Yeah, yeah, wow. It's so, it's, it's you've lived like uh, three careers. Uh, <laughs> it's so, it's so inspiring. Uh, it's so inspiring to, to listen to you and um, kind of look, look back at your, what you've done and how, how you, how you've chosen to live, uh, you, you know, make the most of this this PhD in economics. Um, I'm really, really appreciative of, of uh, your presence in the profession. And thank you so much for sitting down and, and letting me uh, listen and talk to you. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate the service you're providing too. And maybe I just to close that, I mean, you know, we have this incredible privilege, like society is paying for us to be professors or be researchers, you know, and, and they subsidize our PhDs, you know, that to me, that's a gift and it's, but it's also an obligation. Um, and I guess I have a hard time sometimes understanding people who don't see it that way, right. that, you know, it's an opportunity to serve. Right. And, you know, I feel like I've been tossed a lot of opportunities to serve, um, but if I don't take those, yeah. You know, I mean, you, you can't take all of them. You have to choose, obviously. You have to choose right. where you are best suited to serve and you shouldn't try to do everything. Yeah. But if you are given an opportunity to serve that is a great match for your talents where you can be joyful and effective at doing that service, you know, I mean, how, what am I supposed to like, you know, just sit around and go to the beach or like spend my days like sitting at a cafe? Um, if, if, if I have the opportunity to take my time and do something that benefits um, 
society, then I feel like, you know, I, 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 got, I got to go do that. Of course, you can benefit society through theoretical research, through applied yeah. research. There's so many ways to benefit yeah. society. You can mentor. But if you're not writing papers yourself, then you can be mentoring. But you yeah. should be doing something. Right. You know, we, we, we have these gifts. We've been given this education. We've been given a platform and opportunity. And so, you know, how you serve is personal. Right. But I, I think we all need to serve. Yeah. Um, it's otherwise we're almost like we're stealing yeah. by just, you know, going to the beach. Like that's not, we, we're not entitled for society to support. Um, but we are, we're given the opportunity to use our talents and, and it's all very personal how you use your talents and it should be something that's meaningful and purposeful and gives you joy. Cause it, you're not going to be good at it in the long run if you don't like it, but, right. and there's so many ways to serve, but I think all of us um, in the end, we're a service profession and, yeah. and we should be serving. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I completely agree with that. Well, thank you so much, Susan. It's so nice to see you. Uh, I hope, uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Uh, great. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.